Can you all hear me? Yes. Is there anyone who cannot? Okay, well, Will said uh, he had historians coming out of the woodwork, so I'm your termite for today. <laughs> I'm going to start. This is a storyboard. You probably won't be able to see it back at, uh, in the back of the room. However, after the meeting's over, I'm going to leave it here, and you'll be able to come up and look at it if you like, and I'll be here to answer questions as long as you have them. Secondly, I've got a box here that one can hardly lift. This is artifacts from the first settlement of Brookfield. Is uh, Ross Ackerman here? Ross is the chief of police of Brookfield, and his family kindly consented to a permanent loan of these artifacts to the Quaybog Historical Society to put on a permanent display uh, along with this storyboard so that future generations of children may visit and see what happened here, learn about our history, and for the first time in over 300 years, understand what actually happened to that town and where it happened. We're in the process of moving the stones on Foster Hill to the proper sites, and with the courtesy of the Historical Society, we soon will have new signs up there signifying more important uh, things that one has to address to understand the history of the town of Brookfield. So with that, let me start, and before I do, this was made by Robert Ackerman, uh, the gentleman who helped me for 11 years to put this story together. Um, he, had a, such, he was so driven by this that uh, he's not here with us any longer. But in appreciation uh, uh, for the, uh, for the uh, Quaybog Society, which did so many things to display his articles, he made this. Now, this is a, an arrow with dropped bullets. They had not been fired, but they're dropped bullets that he picked up on the sites that I'm going to talk to you about, and he, him and his son Ross, and they, they did this in 1987. He prepared this arrowhead along with this uh, brass plate that says musket balls found in the area of the siege of Brookfield on Foster Hill, August 1675, the King Philip Wars. This will also be donated to the museum in his honor. Now before I start this, let me give you a little idea of what's going on and what happened here. <clears throat> there were many reasons for my break, m migration here. One of the reasons was not that it was ideal land, that, was, that would be a good reason, but primarily it was the we westernmost settlement uh, from uh, the Boston area uh, in 1660 was Marlboro, Mass. And then one had a 60 mile space of woods before you got to the Connecticut River Valley towns of Springfield and Deerfield and so forth and so on. People crossing this expanse, we were uh, superstitious people, you have to know that. We we're afraid of God, we we're afraid we did something wrong or we didn't do something we should have done. We were, either way he was going to get us. They were terrified. They were terrified to cross this, this section. Even the militia had trouble dealing with it. They needed a sanctuary. And when the citizens of New Ipswich applied in 1650, uh, 1656 uh, for, for plantation, uh, they were granted a six mile square plantation, but that grant was lost. 1660, another one was submitted. The land was sold by Shadukas, who was the Indian chief of the area, uh, to uh, Mr. Cooper, Lieutenant Cooper, who was uh, Representative John Pynchon in Springfield. Another Indian raised his head and said, I own part of that land too. His name was Metomp, or Metawumpy, depending on what he wanted to be called on any particular day. And we hear more about him later, because he's the general that executed the siege on Brookfield and went the next year to Lancaster and, and uh, helped to destroy that town. And it's great to know that in September of that year, him and his father Jethro crossed the Boston Common and were hung. So that's something to celebrate come September. Now, up to this point in time, we settled by webbing. A town would be settled, we'd move a little further to the west, settle another town, that would fill up. And fill up would be maybe uh, 30 families, and then we'd say, well, we haven't got enough room. Well, when we had 14 families in Brookfield, we didn't have enough room, we asked for more. They went from six square miles to eight square miles. 
for that few people. You, you wonder, you have to wonder. You know, today we're happy to get a quarter of an acre of land to put our house on. But anyway, what happened was this was a change. And I'm going to read to you a little later on what the leading religious uh, influence in this colony had to say about this. They didn't, he didn't like what we were doing. He didn't like us being settled here. And uh, I'll read what he wrote in a few minutes. Now, I want to uh, take you back to school. I got a pointer, but it's easier than standing in front of the board. All of you been to Foster Hill to see uh, the sites up there and the stones and so forth? Is there anyone who hasn't? Thank heavens. You'll want to go as soon as the historical uh, society gets done with the signs and we get things moved around. Because you're going to remember this, this talk I give here today. And if you don't, you can buy a DVD from the Historical <laughs> Society. This is the, uh, the farm, Indian Rock Farm. This is the barn, and this was Milton Richardson's house. Incidentally, there's a new owner there, and he's very gracious. His wife is very much of a historian. I went up and I showed him my storyboard and told him what I wanted to do up there, and they said I could do anything I wanted. I wanted to move into the house, but they wouldn't <laughs> let me. <laughs> but at any rate, he's very gracious, and uh, he said, yes, we could do whatever we wanted to, and he would preserve those items that were precious to us. So I, I say, I uh, uh, hope one day down the road our historical society will send him a, a letter of thanks, and I'm sure they will. Okay, we, we've identified Milton Richardson's house and his barn. This is his well out there. There's a, there's a stone out there to say, said Major Wilson got shot there. Well, everything's wrong about that, and I'll get to that. There's another marker right beside the driveway that said the fortified house stood here. And it's another mark several hundred yards away saying this was the mark for the first meeting house. Well, this plays into the story of the siege on Brookfield. Another thing to point out to you is there's a slope here, a round hill going downward. Also, there's a slope here going down. This will become important as we talk. Now, as you visit there today, there's stone walls. All these little marks you see are stone walls. This being George Allen Road. This is the road over the hill to Brookfield. And this is the road across Foster Hill. In 1780, the general court ordered that the roads be fenced a distance of six rods wide or 99 feet. So as you enter Foster Hill from the west and go up the hill, you'll notice the, the walls are, are very, very wide part with grass on either side of the road. Well, the roads in those days would have been the width of a cart. Would have been the width of the cart. So you think an eight foot wide road is all you needed. You got 99 feet, so you, what do you do with the other 91 feet? Well, after 1780, Boston was being settled, and its population was growing. A lot of craftsmen who no longer were farming, and herds of cattle, flocks of turkeys, were sent down this road to Brighton, to the market. Either side of this eight-foot road, from here to the fence or the walls, which we later have, was forage. The animals could move down these roads on either side, and they, their lunchbox was there. It was provided for them. Earlier than that, the, the law uh, required, uh, Massachusetts Bay law required the roads be three rods, ride, rods wide. So just beyond Milton Richardson's place, as you're heading west, you look at the walls, and abruptly, there's a jag to the north, maybe 10 feet, and then a jag to the west, or to the east. That jag is right here. That's because this wall wasn't here, but this one was, and this was three rods wide. The same with George Allen Road, which is 49 and a half feet. So you'll see the difference in the roads. That also tells you these roads were made prior to 1780. Now this is important, and I got a dotted line across here, which may be hard for you to see, cutting all the roads to three rods. And this is important for my story. So I'll refer to this a little later on. Now, another thing I did, because I have to take into consideration another field over here, I cut this wall. And so theoretically, this, this, this square, it cuts across here. And this is part of the next field over here. So 
When I get to showing you the artifacts and all, you'll understand what's going on. Now this is going to be difficult, so remember, save your questions until you get up here and you can see them. Now we're going to begin to talk about the items. Remember, this is the same uh, place. Richest's house, his barn. <coughs> the roads are all the same. Everything is identical. And here's Indian Rock sitting up here. You can look now from the road and see Indian Rock. There's a lot of brush about, and the new owner said that he will have the brush cleared as soon as he possibly can so one can see the rock from the road. So with that, I'm going to start to share with you some of the artifacts from that first settlement. Now, remember, you're looking mostly at Mr. Ackerman's collection. What do we see here? Does anyone venture a guess? Oh, a hoe. This is a hoe. Where do you normally find a hoe? Think back. In colonial times, where would you find a hoe? In a garden or at a farm? Where would you store it? In a barn. Great. You must be a farmer. Thank you. I'm going to leave these up here, and at the end of the uh, session here, you may come up and examine them, but please do not handle them. Now the second thing we found up there, you see the little X's here, was a scattering of musket balls. They're pretty hard to see through this, what we have here. But it's strange. If you look carefully, some of them are lead that's been pounded into a cylinder, which was a common thing the Indians did. They would get uh, lead, lead strap, lead bar, and I have some to show you. They would pound it till it fit in the bore of the weapon, put the powder in, a, a plug, and then he would put this in and maybe even, even a grass or a piece of cloth. And he would shoot it at some poor colonists. And some of them had been flattened. Hopefully they didn't hit one of the colonists, but nonetheless, they show up here. One begins to wonder why these things are showing up in this place until we begin to see this next item. This next item shows up. Anybody venture a guess? Rob Lyons. That's a barn pintle. It's a large pintle. It was driven into the post of the door, and the hinge swung on this. We found a barn pintle. Now, where are you going to find a barn pintle? Where there used to be a barn. You got it. Right here next to the hoe in this general area. Now the prize of this package. Bob Ackerman came to me one day and he says, I found this god-awful tool. I don't know what it is. I don't know anything about it. He loaned it to me and I did some work on it. It took a long time, but I come up with what it was. Anybody here venture a guess at what we're looking at? It's got a round edge. Never had a sharp edge. edge? No, nope, didn't have a sharp edge. Nothing to do with a shoemaker. No, I see where you think so, but let me tell you the story of this item. Let me tell you the story of this item. Now, this item was found right here. Sir? Yes, it is. You're both, you're both just about on. This item is called a stubbing hoe, and I'll tell you what they did with it. It was also called a clod breaker. In early New England, before 1700, as one searches through the uh, probates, you find uh, very few, if any, plows. They didn't plow the land. They would come with a spade into a grassland, make a hole, turn it upside down, move on three feet or so again, and further on until the whole area they were going to cultivate was turned over. Let it dry in the sun for a few days. This was handled. Then it would come around with this very heavy tool, whack that mound. It would disintegrate. They would separate the grass and toss it aside with the hoe, pull the dirt back into the hole, and plant their seeds. So if you went to, into a garden in colonial times, it wouldn't be this nicely cultivated garden that one sees nowadays. The garden would be a series of holes. The corn was a series of holes. So this is what this was. And it shows up at this barn. Uh, I'd like to give you a little information on this stubbing hole. I found in the records that in 1671, John Ayers, John Ayers who uh, owned and maintained the house that later became the fortified house, bought from John Pynchon in Springfield at the cost of four shillings uh, a stubbing hole. 
It was made in Springfield by a fellow by the name of John Stewart. Stewart was captured in Dunbar in 1652. He was one of 270 Scotch prisoners, uh, and as a result of this battle, Cromwell later executed Charles I. However, the prisoners from that battle were deported to the colonies for, for life as prisoners of war. Now this fellow, John Stewart, was a blacksmith. And initially he was sent to Saugus, Saugus Iron Works. And John Pynchon made a, an appeal to the general court for a blacksmith because he had none in western Massachusetts. So they assigned John Stewart to him and uh, he stayed in Springfield and worked for John Stewart for the rest of his life. And this clod breaker, which is the only one that shows up on any of the records, we found near the well. Now, we'll move on to the next item I have here. The next item we found, this is a piece of graphite. It's like the, uh, the uh, lead in your pencil. It'll mark if you, if you rub it against something. Uh, you power it up and then mix it with a little bit of fat. And uh, the Indians would paint their faces halfway, whichever way to make them as hideous as possible. This piece of graphite we located right down here by Indian Rock, along with a small scattering of shots. Now the next place we have to move to is this corner here. Now you remember I said earlier I separated the map, and this corner actually belongs down here, but to condense the map I, I shortened it, cut the walls and moved this up in this direction. So this is a bit of a slope moving down like so. So it was a backdrop for something somewhere and bullets were flying through it or over it and hitting into the soil in this further field in great numbers. There was a great number of uh, these bullets that we found at that point. And we moved around and we come to this section in here. And in this section here, one of the first things we find is another one of these, which you saw a little earlier. You recognize that as a hoe. We found this in this vicinity right here. And you associate a hoe with a garden or with a farmer in his fields. Well, there's no indication that this was a farm field. However, uh, it was a clue to something. However, also venturing in this area, we turned up these. These are rot nails. They're, they're not rose head, they're very primitive, flat head rot, rotten nails. These showed up in this vicinity here where there had never been a house to the best recollections of the earlier people who uh, I mentioned uh, early on. Also in the same area we found a scattering of musket balls. Now these musket balls are, are put in this package to keep them in a group because that's what we found there. One is totally flattened, which meant it hit a very hard object. Uh, some are dinged. One is hit like it was hit with a plow, and another has a flat on it. Apparently it uh, struck something in the ground. However, it was found in this general area here. But probably the greatest find, probably the greatest find was this. We found this in this vicinity here. You can see I got it marked here. It's very similar to the pinto that we had found earlier uh, in this section. This is a pinto to a house door where there had never been a house. And uh, this turned up about a foot under the ground in this area here. So I'd like to share this with you and say now we've got all of this evidence of something in this neighborhood here. Very suspicious. Now as we continue around, we're circling something because we're finding evidence here, 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 here. We move around and we come to an area up here. And in this section here, we found musket balls in an area about four feet wide and 24 feet long. Bullets were being fired, apparently at a maximum range because many of them were digging into the dirt and not being deformed. 
Some of them were, had hit, hit something hard, which led us to think that there was something very solid just to the left of that to concentrate bullets in this fashion. Another find was the amulet. Mr. Ackerman found this. This is an important find. That's pretty meaningless to most of you. But if you were an Indian of some significant rank, this is a pendant. You would wear it either on your ear or around your neck. Now, <clears throat> it's called an amulet. William Fowler from the Mass Archaeology Society says this was a personal ornament, a badge of rank, frequently worn from the ear or the neck, V-shaped with a small hole, decorative cuts, and notched. Notched it is, right here where the string is, has a hole through it, has two decorative cuts across it. It's pounded out of a piece of lead that would have made a, a musket ball had the uh, condition arose. However, this became a pendant of some rank. That was found in this area here. Also found there was a small piece of lead. This is the type of things where the Indians ran out of cast bullets. They would use sheet lead and they would pound these into cylinders and keep pounding them until they would fit into the barrel of their weapon. It's lead quite easily malleable. This was found in the general vicinity of the meeting house. Now I'm going to divest slightly to try and share a few more things with you of our early settlement before I move on to the story. This is easy to recognize. Can you recognize what it used to be? A plow? We didn't have any plows then. Oh, you sit in the corner till I'm finished. This is a huge cast iron pot that women usually would have on a crane over the fire. It's a very early one. I, I found that uh, on a rock just inside this gate. I can't figure out why it was, what it was doing there unless somebody got irritated with their husband and threw it and hit him and you see the results. But that's the only reason I could think it would be up there. thing I find. This isn't too hard to, that's a padlock, is it not? Okay, I find no reference to a padlock except one case, and I'm going to read it to you in a few minutes, about the militia coming to town when there was no more a town. This was found between what Mr. Ackerman said was the inn uh, and the bridge on the old military highway that leads into Devil's Elbow. Well, he thought the inn was down the other way. It wasn't, and I'll get to that, too, when we talk about this item. <clears throat> On the back side of Foster Hill, the old military highway of 1673 passed across George Allen Road and went over the north face of uh, Foster Hill. While I was down there one day scrounging around, I picked up a, a, a thing on my metal detector, and I found a horseshoe. And it's relatively small because the animals are small and we still didn't have the, <laughs> the huge uh, Belgians and, and Percherons and what have you in the, United, in the America until the 1820s. But what's unique about this, it's got its nails intact. It had a little ball of rust so they wouldn't fall out of the holes. This was a kit. Remember, they're living here, no blacksmith. They had to do their own repairs. It was on the old road. Somebody lost their kit about a half mile out of town heading west. And complete with the nails that would have, if his horse threw a shoe, he couldn't walk on the roads that we had then very long without being crippled. The kit was there. So I found this in part of another shoe there. This very clearly takes us back to this point in time. Because at a later date, uh, on the next settlement, we began to have people who could shoe animals and what have you. There was not a need to carry a spare. Another thing, too, that shows up there. This is not for gardening. You may think so. I'm, I'm not saying a word. I know you're not. 
I always have to zero in on one person and give them hell all day. <laughs> you can see what this is. Any of you, now Mr. Lyons would know what that is. That's, made, that's a hammer for a shoemaker. Very primitive, very old. And remember, they were about 30 miles from the next settlement. And there were no shoemakers in the first colony. And your shoes were put in with pegs. And if you began to throw a sole or something, who would fix it? Well, you'd go to somebody who had the suitable tool. There'd be another tool, something you'd put inside the shoe to reinforce it and, and drive either new pegs in or re reestablish the soil where it came from. This was found up in the general vicinity of where all this activity happened. This is why I'm showing it to you, because I have no way of knowing if it came from the first settlement, but it's suspicious. This is a wonderful artifact. <coughs> this is a side plate from a snap pants. It's called a banana plate. I went to see the curator at the Higgins Museum about 10 years ago. He was an expert on 16th, 17th, and 18th century weapons. And I said to him, what have we got here? This was found near the gate closest to this marker. He said, that's a banana plate from either a French or a Dutch snap hands. That's an early flintlock. That was state of the art at that point in time. I'll get back to this because I have a, a thing I found a, an article, uh, uh, some reference on why you wouldn't find an Englishman with this because we were too damn cheap. And I'll explain that to you. Small, small round bullets, and it's hard for you to see. This was buckshot. This was found scattered, and this is unfired. There's a couple of them that are flattened, probably hit with a plow. With buckshot and, and, the, and the firearms of the day, after they put the powder and water in, they would put three or four balls or five balls in, and when they fired, it would scatter. So you had a great deal more effect on whoever you're shooting at. This, this was used both by the colonists and by the Indians. But we found the drops all over the place. It's hard to say whether it was Indians who came back after the people vacated the settlement, or it was dropped during the battle, or it was dropped uh, um, in the course of the battle. And last but not least, and this is a treasure. Doesn't take much of an imagination to realize what this is, does it? That is a tomahawk. That's a trade tomahawk. Now what's different about this trade tomahawk was it was found along Route 9 heading west to the, to the south. The river has a second S bend in it. The hollow place where the, S, uh, where the, S, uh, where the land reaches furthest to the, to the uh, south, there's a notch. And the Englishmen, six of them, Five of them from what is now Brookfield, and one from, from West Brookfield. Uh, his home was built two months before he died, and that's the small building uh, attached to Salem, Salem, Salem Cross. Salem Cross Inn. Uh, that was uh, Thomas. If you look here, there's a round mark. That is the blacksmith's stamp from Canada. And it has his mark. It's actually three lines that cross in the middle. People at Fort Ticonderoga said that if we would have sent it up there, they would uh, identify the blacksmith in the approximate period when he manufactured this. We won't do this. But this was found within a few hundred yards of the, where the last Englishmen were killed by Indians in Brookfield. And that was in 1710. The haymakers. The haymakers, absolutely. Isn't that a wonderful artifact? And no, we wouldn't send it up there. We are, it is going to the Historical Society Museum, so uh, that'll be there on permanent display. He probably got shot. Why would you leave something like that? Would you leave your pocketbook anywhere? Only if you got shot, right? <laughs> Someone have a question? Uh, my, my detective will go down. I have a hothead, which, which will take me down almost three feet. Uh, the ones that we're using are usually, it'll give us eight to ten inches. Most everything we found here will come within, I would say, a foot of the surface. Really? Yes. Now, with all this information, I'm going to flip to the last page, and you're certainly never going to know what that says. But we have some neat references here. 
We have a historical discourse that was written right here in West Brookfield, Massachusetts, on November 27, 1828, by the Reverend Joseph Foote. And the neat thing about this is he has the narrative Wheeler's Surprise. And he goes on to explain why it's the only complete one that was written. Up to this point in time, we lost the back half of it until a gentleman uh, named Shattuck befriended him and sent him the rest of the uh, uh, story on uh, Wheeler's Surprise. So now we have the entire story. This gentleman has a lot of insight, and I'll, I'll quote him as we go further in. But this is a wonderful little uh, missile, and I think that the Quaybog Historical Society has copies of this. So when they get open for business, uh, it's well worth reading. Now, we have the storyboard here, and I want to try to relate all the artifacts that I found. Remember I found all these uh, tools, stubbing hoe and the barn pintle and the hoe, uh, the granite from Indian Rock, the shots, and I found the small pintle, all these shots here, another uh, hoe. We move up here and we find the amulet and the other shots. We had to put this, all this into a story because heretofore, the Quaybog Historical Society in 1903, they didn't have the advantage of model, uh, uh, modern metal detectors, nor did they have uh, the ability to research such as we can do today. <clears throat> they did the best they could. Somebody heard that there was a place uh, where nothing would grow. Well, they had a place like right here, they thought. Therefore, the marker went there. They had a well here. So they marked that as Major Wilson's well, because Wheeler Surprise said that Major Wilson got shot near the well. They moved the meeting house way down here, and heavens only knows why they did that. But let me tell you how we put this story together. Using Wheeler's narrative, Wheeler is the captain, captain of militia who came here with, with Captain Hutchison uh, and 20 men to negotiate with the Indians to try to forestall the, uh, the, a war, an impending war. They were massacred at uh, Metamesset in the southern part of New Braintree, and for the first time in North America, the English army broke and ran. They ran down what is now probably Main Street in North Brookfield, down Devil's Elbow Road, they approached, approached town from the east, and up into town, warning people along the way, uh, better get on Shanks Mayor, the Indians are coming and they're mad. There's one lady down at the foot of the hill in Devil's Elbow, she just, she had a one-year-old child and she had a baby the day before, Mrs. Trumbull. Her husband was off in Springfield. He was a going man. He was going doing errands for people. She took those two children and walked more than a mile over Devil's Elbow. And if you ever walk there yourself, you're going to be hard pressed to, to see how a woman who just had a child and carrying another could possibly make that trip. The Indians didn't catch her, but they caught her neighbor, James Hurry, Hovey. He died. He was found in the road down there. But the fact remains, they hurried up here. Well, Major Wheeler wrote a dissertation on what happened, what he remembered. He was an educated man. This is Captain Wheeler, I misspoke. He wasn't a major, he was Captain Wheeler. What he said was, many things happened. First and foremost, from the rock, an Indian had fired and there was a well sweep, well pull. You know, it's weighted. It's weighted, you dip the, the pail in and then the weight helps to bring the water back to the top. Also, he was behind a fence. The Indian shot where he thought he was and hit him in the mouth. He jumped up and said he had been killed. He managed to run to the house being killed. That was unique too. But the fact remains that these, these types of fences were very common then. They were horizontal boards built around the kitchen garden. Hey, what did we find? What do you use in a garden? I spoke again to this uh, expert down at the uh, museum, and I said, how efficient would be the, the smoothbore weapons uh, 1675? What would be a maximum range? He says, well, if, 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 if a man with a lot of experience had fired at 80 yards, he stood a chance maybe one in 10 of hitting somebody. At 100 yards, he didn't stand a prayer. So I had to take that for gospel because uh, uh, you know, there's nobody alive now that lived then with those weapons that can tell us any differently, but his study showed us that. 
So with that in mind, on, uh, in the spring of uh, it would be 1995, Mr. Ackerman and John Crusell from Northbrook Field consented to help me. I did a survey. I did a survey of this site, taking into consideration Captain Wheeler's report, as well as the artifacts that came out of the ground. So when we went to the rock, and he says, well, a maximum is 100 yards. I laid out a line, and I struck an arc. And I drove a stake in with approximately this area, because that's where the accumulation of material showed up. Captain Wheeler also said that the Indians were firing at us from the meeting house. The meeting house, he says, was 20 rods away. That's 330 feet. We took an arc, and we swung it. And we put stakes along the way. We ran into all this stuff here. We put a stake in here with a flag. One other thing. From Ayers Barn, the Indians built two carts. It was a push cart with two wheels. The oxen would draw. They filled one with combustibles. And they kept adding to the tongue of it, pushing it down the hill, Mr. Wheeler says, until it came to rest against the house. Here's a hill right here. Until it came to rest against the house, and then a second device. Certainly they were getting help because this was not of the Indian culture. This was the European culture that was teaching them to do this sort of thing. They built another device, and they had a huge platform in front of them with heavy planks so that they could push that down for the sole purpose of getting close enough to wherever they put this first cart to fire fire arrows into the combustibles and set the house afire. Now they set the house afire once and two men went out, cut through the wall, went out and put the fire out. Both got shot, but they lived. <coughs> Jehovah took hand then because the second time when they had the combustibles against the house and it started to burn, he brought down an August shower and put out the put out the uh, hemp and what have you, and they couldn't get it started again. He said they pushed these carts 14 rods from Ayers Barn. Notice all the gunshot up here? Somebody's shooting at them. Well, again, we went to this post and we struck this arc. Son of a gun, look what we found. We found all the artifacts. It goes right back to this one spot. Now we're right across the road from Milton Richardson's house. But there's a lot more evidence than that. Now we had, he says, 80 yards is the furthest that uh, you could effectively think to hit a man. So we went along this line for 80 yards. And what did we find in the underbrush? A well, a very old well, even with the surface of the ground, still filled with water. The well is there today, and it's going to remain there. The farmers agreed to keep that. If this was a fortified house, and this was the garden, the, the kitchen garden, the well would be in that. If the fortified house were up here, the well would be in the front yard. Major Willard, who comes to relieve the siege on Brookfield on the night of the 4th, puts his animals into the animal holding pen in the front yard. You wouldn't have your well in your yard with your animals, would you? Most people wouldn't. They knew enough about sanitation to not do that. Well, we have a well here. Reverend Foote, whom I told you wrote this dissertation or did the discourse, wrote an article. This was in 1828. He discovered in the northwest corner this is the northwest, this being north, this being west. This is Milton Richardson's house across the road. He says in the northwest corner of Mr. Marsh's property. Mr. Marsh goes down here for two fields. This was the northwest corner of Mr. Marsh's property. They discovered an unknown well there. He's the fellow who went and quizzed the uh, local residents. He spoke to the... Um, oldest residents in town, and those people could have been born before 1750. He talked to those residents. None of them can ever remember a building being in this spot.
west, he just says, west of this new location is a hill which corresponds with Captain Wheeler's description. And the evidence clearly shows the distances to help to highlight these spots. Well, I wish I had read that uh, discourse before we went to all this trouble of trying to figure out what happened here because that would have helped us enormously. He fur says further, there's a well in the southwest corner of the Old Smith lot. Well, the Old Smith lot was over here. They had bought this from Dickerson. This Smith's well had nothing to do with the uh, first settlement whatsoever. Even though the marks there. Now, incidentally, the fellow got shot in the mouth and jumped up and said he'd been killed and run for the house. One of the Indians behind Indian Rock jumped up and said, I kill Major Wilson. He was not a major. He was a private. He was the only illiterate settler on the hill. For, for uh, years and years afterwards, every time he had a land transfer, uh, he would place an X and his father would co countersign. He could not read or write. He couldn't be a, an English officer. He couldn't uh, communicate. He couldn't uh, transmit information suitably. So Private Wilson was shot in the mouth. He screamed he was killed. Well, he obviously wasn't killed, but he did get into the house. Now I wanted to tell you about uh, the weapons. Oh, I'm sorry. That's a money issue. <laughs> I want to tell you about the weapons. Changing Military Technology in New England, written by Patrick Malone, 1600 he covers till 1677. He said the Indians had adopted English firearms quite early in the period of colonization. They choose among available weapons those best suited for forest warfare. Forest warfare, that's a magic word. And when I talk to you about increased math, you'll see where that comes into place. Remote settlements. Example, expensive flintlocks rather than the cheaper matchlocks, which were favored by the passimonious colonists when supplying their own militia. They were cheapskates then, too. They also had craftsmen capable of maintaining their store of arms. Now we knew with these two weapons, uh, these wagons fixed up with long tongues and all the things, that they had an in influence, a European influence. 1767, the militia returns to Boston. <clears throat> it says, uh, as of February 5th, the army returned to Boston, not having ob obtained the ends of their going forth. They didn't get the intelligence they were looking for. It goes on to say, it was easy to conjecture that the Narragansetts, Nipmunks, Quabog, and River Indians of the upper Connecticut River Valley being all come together and that the army had returned. There was nobody there to defend the frontier. We were on the frontier. That they would speedily fall upon the frontier towns. And some of the praying Indians, these were the good guys. Those are the good guys that are allowed to own oxen and build houses like white men and dress like white men and, and, uh, and profess to, uh, to uh, adore the same God. They were sent out as spies and be had been with the Indians beyond Quaybog. They brought intelligence that a Frenchman who came from Kennedy had been amongst them animating against the English and promise, promising a supply of ammunition and that they would come next summer and assist them. By the time next summer came, King Philip was dead and his head was on a pike. So consequently, uh, that uh, played no part whatsoever in our war. But I want to tell you about the most significant religious leader that we had, probably with more power than the government, and certainly as much as the council. The most significant religious leader we had was Increase Mathers, and he wrote a lot. Here's what he wrote, and wait till you hear what he said. <clears throat> Remember, forest plantation is a plantation such as Brookfield, set apart. It's a, plant, it's a, it's a settlement set apart. <clears throat> Increase Mathers writes, the King Philip Wars, the English have become like Indians, whoring after strange gods. In other words, they dared to have a settlement without a seated uh, preacher. They had a volunteer who had never been to school. He was not ordained. How dare they do that? He preached against that his entire life, and his son picked it up where he left off. Immigrating to forest plantations without instituted worship, he said the Indians, by murdering these whites, is therefore 
self-murder. In other words, because they dared to have a settlement without a seated minister, they had committed suicide. God's wrath had used the Indians to punish the guilty English, the most powerful uh, religious influence in the colony. <clears throat> now, we'll move on. In 1715, they agreed to have a seated minister, and they agreed to hire this Mr. Cheney, who had just uh, graduated from Harvard. They were going to have a seated minister at last, and they, they asked him, uh, uh, what are your terms? Well, his terms were 52 pounds of pay a year, uh, build me a house, build me a barn, and cut me so many wood, so much wood for so many years. When he got to think it over, he came back and he said, I want all these other things. Incidentally, they said he, they would do that, but he'd have to furnish the glass and the nails. They were pretty dear. You didn't have them, you know, you'd make without, you could make without, but, uh, but uh, anyway, he chose instead to accept the townhouse now standing. This is really important, because that sent me on a, on a quiz that lasted for years. The townhouse now standing. What are they doing with a townhouse? We have no record of a townhouse yet. We do have, but it's somewhat vague and lost in history for a while. <coughs> Going to the archives. It says, February 21st, 1676, the council in Boston ordered a carpenter tools for six men, nails of all sorts, hooks and hinges for doors and locks, all of such sort as the chief carpenter shall appoint to be sent up to Quaybog to build quarters for the militia. Somebody was going to come here a year after the town was destroyed and build a building. February 25th, 1676, the council ordered John Brewer of Sudsbury or John Coolidge of Watertown to go to Quaybog and build the quarters for the militia. Same year, the council voted to raise 100 foot soldiers and 72 troopers, the 72 troopers were mounted, to go to the frontier for patrol. Captain Turner left uh, 11 men and one sergeant, Sergeant William Ingrid in Quaybog as a permanent detachment. Now this permanent detachment was in this house built for uh, 12 men. So you see it's a pretty sizable building, you know? And the fact remains that when they leave, they would, they would not leave people behind. They would all go on whatever investigation the frontier they were doing. Therefore, their <coughs> supplies and, and ordnance had to be locked up. We have a reference to a lock, we find a lock you can almost put them together. Not quite, but you can say, you know, it makes sense. Maybe, maybe they do uh, apply, because we find no other records of locks in that century. Not, not here in Brookfield. Well, Captain Turner left 11 men and a sergeant and went on to uh, uh, Hadley and to his doom. The records say the flower of Essex was destroyed along the river. They were picking grapes. They left their weapons in the wagons to go and pick armfuls of grapes, and the Indians chose that point in time to attack and kill nearly 80 of them. This garrison, this garrison was continued to be maintained all during the period when there was no town here from, from 1675 until 1686 when a new town began to be settled. And that new town up on uh, Elm Hill Farm Road in Brookfield, it was a small nucleus around the town market that developed and about six months later, down here by Gilbert Fort was another nucleus of the town. They couldn't use the old land because it was still tied up in deeds, and we still were uh, a government of laws at that point in time. You couldn't move on to somebody else's land until you negotiated. Therefore, they found land on either side. So the town of Brookfield started up again in 1686 uh, in two different places at the same time. The records show what kind of problems that created, too. The massacre of 1692 very clearly shows why this was not a good idea. <clears throat> now, the minister moves into his, into his place, and he's, and he's living here. In 1746, uh, he gives up the ghost and he dies. Then the Rice family comes along, and the Rice family says, we'll buy that. 
and they bought the townhouse. This fellow here describes the townhouse as directly across the road from the meeting house. Does it make sense? Yes, it does. They built a tavern in the inn there by 1783. The 1794 Hale map, which is a very well done map, it was uh, surveyed, you can measure it, it very clearly shows that this is the site of Rice's Tavern. Many coins are found there, and the Ackerman family notified me last week they were going to do donate a great number of coins, colonial uh, period coins, to the museum. So as soon as they accumulate them, I'll be bringing those down. But they said they didn't want those locked away in glass. They wanted those put in such a position that if school children came, they would be able to look at them. They're well-worn, so you're not going to detract from their value, but have them handle these and look at them and talk about them. I'm sure that the society will respond to that request. <coughs> the townhouse is gone, replaced by an inn. Now, when Cheney had his house built, one of the stipulations was they would put him in a well and stone it up. Well is still there, right where we found the artifacts, right where we found the barn. The well still sits on the hill. It's got a huge capstone on it, but it's still there. That was the well they laid up at Cheney. That was the well that served the uh, Rice Tavern. And this is the well where they found all the coins. So apparently with shallow pockets bending, bending over to get water, they. Uh, they, they left a few for us. <clears throat> now, one important thing to mention about Rice's Tavern. In uh, 1783, the stage wagons came through here, came through this town. They were regular farm wagons. They were four-wheel vehicles, some of the first we had ever seen in this part of the country. The seats on them were planks laid across the sideboards. It would hold up to 11 people and a driver. You would sit on that out in the weather, no cover, and you would bounce your way from Boston to Hartford. Now, part of the stipulation of getting a ticket was that if they had trouble on the hills or got stuck, you got out and pushed. <laughs> if the horses couldn't pull it up the hill, you got out and did what you could to help them do that. And with the back hill in Brookfield, people were forever being called to the Justice of Peace in Springfield and being sued because we didn't keep the road open and clear. It was slate. It's hard to keep it clean. Well, anyway, in the, I forget the date, but I have it here somewhere. October 20th, 1783, they were going to start the, the service, the, the, the wagon. This is people in commerce from Hartford to Springfield. One wagon started at Hartford. Another wagon started at Boston. They met two days later at Rice's Tavern. We were exactly midway. It was a two-day trip from Boston to Rice's Tavern, and two days from Hartford to Rice's Tavern. I won't get into the cost, but most of us wouldn't be traveling if you had to pay the cost, let alone the sitting on that thing and bouncing all your way all the way to Hartford. Now, I'm going to finish up here, and I'll answer any questions you have, because I could talk all day on this. But I had a question by a really fine gentleman, Mr. Jenkins down here. Are you talking about the cemetery? And that started me thinking, you know the old cemetery? There's a marker up there, and it's accurate. And it tells you where the cemetery is, so many rods, and you've got to think about it. A rod is, anybody venture a guess? Six feet and a half feet. You get a gold star. <laughs> it's, it's accurate. Now, I'm going to tell you why it's accurate. But first, let's get to the cemetery. It wasn't the, ha uh, prob uh, it wasn't the, uh, the, the habit in those days putting stone markers on people's graves. When they died, they would drive a wooden peg in the ground. They would either scratch or burn in initials or something to identify this is where they were. And you'd never go back and see, see the grave again, be it a child or your parent or who, whomsoever. Because you've got to remember, we had a loving God. That cemetery was, was a, a form of purgatory. They were going to stay there until Judgment Day. Okay? God was good. That cemetery was pretty bad. That was not a good place to go. Often, even the ministers didn't go to the cemetery during the funeral. They would have it at the meeting house and then let the, let the family and friends take the, gra uh, take the people to their graves. The only time you'd visit is when you had another member of your family and then you would put them in and drive another stake. Well, how do we know that was a cemetery down there? Well, there was this wonderful fella, uh, Alvin Whiting. 
who came right after the minister I had been quoting, Mr. Foote, to West Brookfield. And he was a great historian. He stayed here for a long time. He wrote this huge historical dissertation on the town. There's a lot of things to say about it. <clears throat> what he says was, what he says was that he came uh, uh, to, to a site where the Revolutionary War soldier was quite old. He pointed out where the cemetery was and he said that there had been just stones set down in various places. There was no, uh, created, no stones that were carved or any such thing as that because we didn't have uh, a, a slate foundry close by, nor did we have stone cutters capable of doing this sort of thing. That's the only time you'd find slate stones at this point in time. <coughs> so anyway, he went there with him in 1820 with the Revolutionary War soldier. He planted at that time four white oak trees. Two are still standing. One fell down in the 1938 hurricane that came through here and another fell in 1955. The other two are still remaining so you can define the cemetery. And in that cemetery there are five people buried. Suzanne Ayers writes very early from 1665 to 1675 five people are there. In 1667 James Younglove, brother of this acting minister, died. In 1671, John Warner, 11 months son of Sam Warner, died. Sam Warner was the son of John Warner, who was probably the first settler in Brookfield in 1660. And his home site is where the historical, Quaybog Historical S Society's picnic area and lawn is where their map board is on Foster Hill. And the well that's there very well might have been uh, his, his well. 1672, in August, Abigail Hovey Ayers. She's the sister of the Hovey that was killed down on uh, Devil's Elbow Road during the siege. Daughter of Deacon Hovey and wife of John Ayers, Jr. His father was killed during the siege at Metamesset. Prior to 1674, Hannah Parsons, daughter of Thomas Parsons, and sadly, June 14th, the same year, Sarah Dale Parsons, uh, his wife, died. Now, something interesting happened there, and I, I, I've got to wrap up here, but I want to, I want to uh, tell you, uh, someone raised a question about twins. Well, you know, if women are prone to twins, they sometimes can have more than one set of twins. <coughs> Joan Kent broke the record. She had three sets of twins. Her daughter, Sarah, married Richard Coy, Jr., another settler. In 1674, she hadn't turned 14 yet. In the fortified house, while it was under attack and surrounded by three to 500 Indians, the mother had twin boys. Lo and behold, the daughter Sarah had twin boys at the same time. Two sets of twins were born in that fortified house. <coughs> After the uh, town uh, was destroyed and the people left, these, these four boys are lost to history. And the very last question, Will, e Will Early himself asked this question. He called me on the phone one day and he says, how many people were in the fortified house during the attack? And I started to tell him, he says, 99. That's okay. <laughs> 99. Actually, it was a lot more than that, but he was right. It was four room house. It, it, it had an attic. It was like a ranch house you'd find today. People who visited the inn could sleep on a pallet upstairs. Okay, that was their accommodations. No beds, no bedroom, no, oh, that was, uh, you wouldn't have that sort of thing. However, it was a four room house. Sturbridge records in 17, 30s show that the average size house was 18 foot square in that community. Have to say, that's, that's progress. We're all the way up to that point in time. So it certainly wouldn't have been much bigger at colonial time. So say it's a double house, because it had four rooms, two down and actually one upstairs, but we'll call it two. Uh, so you can see it was a relatively small house. August 3rd, 4th, and 5th. On August 3rd, there were 79 Brookfield citizens, including women and children. That afternoon, 20 militia, including three Indians, which was including several wounded men, joined the, the group. Now we got 99 and Will hit it out of the park. But he didn't get to third base yet. <coughs> Captain Willard, a uh, Major Willard, out between Marlboro and Lancaster looking for the Indians. What he didn't know was the Indians he was looking for were attacking Brookfield. He heard that Brookfield was under attack changed his orders without permission of the council and rode for Brookfield. He arrived at night, one hour after dark, 
left. All the herd of the horses running into Brookfield from the east. Um, you know, horses, uh, animals running have a herding instinct. They hear the other ones running and all of them try to join. So all the cattle from all the settlers and other animals joined in and they came roaring into town. Wilson said he, uh, Willard said he puts his, put his animals, his horses into a pen in front of the fortified house. <coughs> the Indians thought the whole militia from Massachusetts was there with all this noise. They fired a few more rounds, shot some horses in the corral, a few more the next day they harassed. But as of that night, with 46 of the militia, two officers, and five Indians, it made 152 people in that small four-room house. One of the youngsters on one of my tours waved his hands halfway through the thing. I finally had a call on him because he was so distracting. And I said, what can I do for you? He says, well, it was August, and you said it was dog days. Yeah. He says, well, mister, it must have stunk in there. <laughs> well, my <laughs> Lord, of course it did. He didn't even have to ask the question. But out of the mouth of babes, can you imagine the situation? Well, listen, I'm good at done. My time is up. I want to thank you very much for your attention. Everybody stayed awake and alert. <laughs> thank you. If anyone cares to look at these artifacts close up, feel free to, but please do not handle them. I'm going to whack your knuckles if you do. Thank you all for coming and you're free to leave.